Hello and a warm welcome to this ICAST webinar. I'm David Mingus, Director of Practice at ICAST, and it's my great pleasure to be uh, taking you through this webinar today. Well, our twice yearly tax update webinars are always highly anticipated events within the ICAST community, providing you with the most up-to-date insights into the latest tax announcements. While planning this webinar, we were slightly concerned that there might, be, might, might not be too much to cover, given the early briefings to journalists on the Chancellor's autumn statement, which suggested there was limited room for manoeuvre in government finances. However, just days before the Chancellor's statement, whispers of tax cuts and additional tax benefits for both businesses and individuals started to surface. As you know, the Chancellor's speech serves only as the public appetizer, teasing the underlying details that are unveiled in the accompanying statement documentation. So what were the key tax points from the Chancellor's autumn statement and what nuggets were there hidden deep in the Green Book and other announcements made alongside the statement? Well, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, we'll hopefully unravel these complexities, ensuring that whether you're in practice or working in business, you have a clear understanding of the tax landscape and how those changes will affect you. And to help you with this, I'm delighted to be joined today by Chris Campbell, Head of Tax, Tax Practice and OMB Taxes at ICAS. Chris is a Chartered Accountant and Chartered Tax Advisor and joined ICAS after a career in practice supporting owner-managed businesses. He supports members with technical queries and represents ICAS on various HMRC stakeholder groups, including the Making Tax Digital Forums, both for uh, income tax self-assessment and software implementation, the Timely Payment Working Group, the Agents Digital Design Advisory Group, the Penalty Reform Forum and HMRC Additional Needs Working Group. But before I hand over to, ICA, uh, over to Chris, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you of. Uh, I want to encourage you to get the most out of today's webinar by having your questions answered. You can, of course, submit any questions at any time through the live Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be su submitted anonymously or only to the presenters for this webinar if you wish. And of course, we won't identify who questions come from when we get to the Q&A section. You can also join the conversation today through the discussion forum, which is also accessed at the bottom of your screen. The forum allows you to comment or to discuss with fellow attendees on matters covered by this webinar. We are, of course, recording the webinar and we'll be making it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or share it with others. And you'll also be able to find the slides for this webinar alongside the on-demand video at icast.com forward slash webinars. So we look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar. And of course, we'll try to get as many of those as possible. But I know Chris has an awful lot of material to get through, so without uh, taking up any further time, I'll hand straight over to Chris. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'm joining you from a very drich CA house uh, this morning. Um, so I hope wherever you are watching this webinar form that um, the weather's not too bad. I mean, this time of year, we often have snow, so we can't complain too much. Um, so just a little overview of what I plan to talk about today. Um, the bulk of it is going to be to do with the UK autumn statement that we had just a couple of weeks ago. Before focusing on a little bit on making tax digital for income tax self-assessment, there were some announcements that were lurking behind the detail of the Chancellor's speech that I'll cover because I think that will affect quite a number of the people watching this webinar. Uh, before touching briefly on the cash basis for self-employed and some other topical tax issues and hopefully there'll be an opportunity for any questions that you might have at the end. If we don't have time to answer them just now, we'll of course follow up with them later on. So first of all, the autumn statement. Now, as David said a minute ago, this was expected to be a very light touch fiscal event. There was lots of press briefings which suggested the Chancellor didn't have much room for manoeuvre. So we weren't expecting to have a huge amount to fill this webinar with, but how wrong could we be? Because when the Chancellor made his statement to the House of Commons on the 22nd of November, it contained 110 so-called growth measures. Now, the devil is behind the detail, and that came out in the Autumn Finance Bill. That was published on the 29th of November. That did not, however, include the national insurance changes, and there's a separate national insurance contributions reduction in rates bill currently going through Parliament. 
as, as many of the people watching this webinar will be based in Scotland, it's important to remember that the Scottish budget is taking place next week, a week today, on the 19th of December, and that will set the Scottish rate of income tax and other devolved tax measures. So we'll be giving more details on the content of that as and when we, we find out about it. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to focus mainly on the UK autumn statement on the 22nd of November. So what were the key takeaway points? Well, the one that we very few people expected was the reduction in national insurance. Now, for those people who are employed, that will be employees class one national insurance, a reduction in the main rate. Important to note that that is not the additional rate that applies for employees earning above the upper earnings limit. The abolition of class two national insurance in the main for self-employed and the reduction in the main rate, again, it's the main rate, not the additional rate of class four national insurance for self-employed people. Alongside the autumn statement, there was announcements on the national living wage increases um, across the board on that taking effect from April. And there are also some employment taxes changes for those affected by IR35 and the construction industry scheme. As ICAS had been calling for, the capital allowances full expensing for companies has been made permanent. And there have also been some research and development regime changes for companies that I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. There was talk of some more money for HMRC, but before everyone celebrates too much, it's not for improved customer service, it's on the debt collection side of things. ICAST has been calling for more resources for HMRC to deliver better customer services for our members and their clients. But sadly, there's no money forthcoming in this fiscal event. So before I look at what has changed, I think it's important to remember what hasn't. There's a number of things that haven't actually, there were no announcements on certain areas, but that doesn't mean to say that there won't be changes in those areas because we have a spring budget expected before the uh, Easter recess. We don't have an exact date for that, but there's still opportunities for many of these things that are on the slide to change before the new tax year. The personal allowance, which has been frozen at £12,570, that there's been no announcement on that this time round. So that will continue as at the moment until April 28. UK income tax rates, for the next tax year, there's no any indication that those will change. As I said a few moments ago, the Scottish tax rates will be announced next week. So we'll wait to see what that brings. Class one national insurance, although there's been changes in the national insurance rate, that hasn't applied, it affected the, the threshold. Um, so that remain aligned with the UK higher rate threshold. So that upper earnings limit for that class one national insurance remains unchanged. After quite an eventful changes and U-turns, et cetera, on the corporation tax front over the last couple of years, although there's an announcement on full expensing, the corporation tax rates themselves remain unchanged at 25% and 19%, but there's still scope to change those again, potentially in a spring budget. There was a lot of spec press speculation on inheritance tax in the weeks leading up to the autumn statement. There was a suggestion that there could be the abolition of inheritance tax at one extreme or some tinkering about with reliefs along the way. But at this fiscal event, the autumn statement made no changes. Despite one of the areas of a lot of speculation, this was something that actually never came to pass. But I wonder if it's possible to see, we might see something happening on that in the spring budget that's coming up in the new year. But as it stands, the inheritance tax nil rate band remains frozen at um, current levels until April 28. The VAT registration threshold, again, it has remained unchanged by this fiscal event, and that's an earlier review date of April 2026. And no changes to the capital gains tax annual exemption, which reduced in eight, down to £6,000 from April this year, and is due to go down £3,000 in April next year.
So we talked about the national insurance changes in the autumn statement. It's time to look at the detail on those. So we'll start with class one national insurance. Now, for those of you who are following the um, legislation, this is clause one of the National Insurance Contributions Reduction in Rates Bill. Now, I've put the date of the change in bold because there's a different date applying for class one compared to class four. So the main rates of a class one employees national insurance are reducing from the 6th of January 2024. So for those of you who work in software or know someone who does work in the payroll software, they're going to have a busy few weeks helping uh, the software um, cope with the new change that's taken effect from the 6th of January. I think the Chancellor wanted to make sure that the new rates could have a um, more immediate effect uh, rather than waiting to the new tax year. So it's starting from the 6th of January. Then for category A, class one national insurance, now that's the national insurance that most employees will pay. That's reducing from 12% down to 10%. Category B national insurance, now that is the reduced rate that married women were able to opt for if they were married before a date, I think it was 1977. So there's not that many of them left because many of them are now at or above state pension age. And I think over the next few years, it'll become a, a mathematical certainty that um, that will be the case because most people who were legally, uh, legally able to get married in the 1970s will have reached state pension age in the in the next few years. So that'll disappear. But while that's still here, they're, they're still getting the 2% reduction. And that's from 5.85% down to 3.85%. It's important to remember that these national insurance changes are only affecting the employees themselves. It's not affecting any of the employer aspects of national insurance, whether that be class one on salaries or class 1A on benefits in kind, or class 1B for those who um, opt to pay national insurance via PMI settlement agreements, etc. No changes to those rates because the government has decided that it wants to only change the rates of employee national insurance. It's kind of interesting in a way that this is a targeted uh, intervention because it's only involving those who are working because national insurance is not paid on things like pensions, etc. And it also is a UK wide, um, UK wide, uh, the national insurance is UK wide, it's not devolved. So it means that they can make a decision at UK wide level that will affect all, all four nations of the UK. So it's kind of interesting in a way that that's the, the route that the Chancellor opted to, to take. So from the 6th of January, everyone who is employed will notice a difference in their pay packets. For those who are self-employed, two changes. Um, the first one is in respect of class four national insurance. So that's contained in clause two of the national insurance contributions, reductions and rates bill. Now, interestingly, that change will take effect from 6th April, 2024, as opposed to 6th January. It's a bit trickier to make that kind of change in a, during a tax year. So it kind of makes sense for it to um, take slightly later in effect. So those um, self-employed taxpayers will see their national insurance class four rate reduced by 1% as opposed to the two. That reduces from 9% to 8%. And there is a smaller reduction there, but then that will take, a fa uh, take account of the class two national insurance change that's also been announced, which will affect employees. It's important to remember that there's no change to the 2% rate for any profits above the upper earnings limit. And for the class two national insurance changes, now this is clause three of the national insurance contributions reduction in rates bill. There's a removal to, of the requirement to pay class two national insurance contributions. This is a bit of a techie point because the press headlines will be that class two national insurance have been abolished. Well, they've not been abolished per se, it's just a removal of the requirement to pay class two that self-employed businesses will have if they have profits above the threshold. Now, the small profits threshold is frozen at £6,725. 
and self-employed taxpayers with profits between that and 12,570 will still accrue their national insurance credits. But for those who do not have profits at that level, the 6,725, there's still the option to pay voluntary class two national insurance contributions. Now that rate has been frozen at £3.45 per week for 24.25. Now that would be particularly relevant if you had a client who needed to maintain their eligibility for state benefits. Uh, the main one that we often think of is state pension where you need to have a number of years qualifying service um, to make sure you get the maximum entitlement on the on reaching state, the state pension age. Now on this slide here is a little ready reckoner. Um, I, I'm not proposing to go through it in any major detail um, because it's quite small in print, but I was just to draw your attention to the fact that when the autumn statement was released, we had an uh, article on the ICAS website and this little ready reckoner of the national insurance changes was made. So it's, it's worth having a look at just to see for the different profit levels what um, what the changes would be. So we talked a lot about employees, national insurance, but there were some other employment taxes changes in the autumn statement. Now we'll start first of all with the national living wage. Now that's increased from £10.42 per hour to £11.44 per hour from the 1st of April 2024. There'll be lots of press coverage of this and how it's a significant increase for those who are uh, receiving an income at or around the national living wage level. It's important to bear in mind, though, that many of your clients will be of a uh, side that uh, this will be an extra cost for them. And with some people who have employees at um, national living wage level, this will be an additional, so it's welcome news for the employees, but it's an additional cost for, for particularly um, relevant for small businesses who might find such an increase um, more challenging in terms of having to pass that on to their customers and whether that can be passed on and so forth. But um, that's going up from April, 2024. Key point to bear in mind is that the eligibility for national living wage is that is based uh, on age. So the, the age threshold is going to be reduced uh, down to 21 years of age for the first time. For younger employees, the national minimum wage is £8.60 per hour for 18 to 20 year olds and £6.40 per hour for 16 to 18 year olds. The apprentice rate is also going to be £6.40 per hour. So it's just a little bit of, um, for some businesses that will have uh, a bit of an impact, it's always important to bear in mind the need to comply with national minimum wage and national living wage um, legislation. It's The national living wage, of course, isn't the same as the voluntary living wage, which the Living Wage Foundation um, publish each year. That's a separate um, figure, but the national living wage has to be paid going forward for those who are aged 21 and over. There's quite a lot of work going behind the scenes on national minimum wage compliance. And it's something that I know my colleague Justine has and will continue to publish articles and guidance for our members on to make sure that their them and their clients don't get caught out by any unexpected consequences of the legislation. Moving on to IR35. Now, most people on this webinar will know what IR35 is. It was first introduced back in 2000. It's been with us quite a long time, where there's an employment intermediary relationship in place. So typically, if you have Joe Blogs um, using a company called Joe Blogs Limited uh, to carry out work that would disguise what would otherwise be an employee-employer relationship. There's been some changes in recent years in terms of the obligations on the engagers uh, for 2017 for the public sector and 2021 for the private sector. And there's been a requirement for those engagers to consider whether or not their arrangements would be caught by R35 
and if they are, you're looking at a payroll obligation for the deemed payment. And there's various criteria as to how to work out that deemed payment that I haven't got time to, to cover this morning. Um, but where there is a deemed payment at the moment, there's currently no right of offset for the tax that the worker has paid. So the deemed payment will um, result in a tax and national students charge being made, um, but at the moment it's not possible to deduct. So there's an element of uh, double taxation in place. So the new finance uh, bill contains provisions for offsetting uh, mechanisms uh, to take effect so that if an employee is caught by Chapter 10 of Part 2 of ITPA 2003, um, it is possible to have an offset. Now that will be based on the officer's best estimate. So it's going to be in place for going forward, but it will be possible for any open cases um, to go as far back as 2017. Now, I notice that's the date of the uh, public sector engagement coming in. It's also worth flagging up that HMRC's recently issued some guidelines for compliance on off payroll working. So if it's something that's of interest to you, um, I would encourage you to have a look at those. And on a slightly different note, um, the construction industry scheme, there's a change that's taken effect and that's to do with, um, first of all, payments from landlords to tenants. Now the so-called CAT A payments, they are going to be exempted going forward. Now this is something that we welcome um, because it means that there will be, um, it will avoid instances or uh, where arrangements where work was necessarily being done to a building um, and it was being reimbursed by the landlord to the tenant and that was going to be getting caught up in, in CIS registration. So that's a welcome development. Um, it'll hopefully mean that there's not a tax reason why building work that needs to get done can't get done in these um, tenanted buildings. The second issue and CIS is to do with VAT. I think this is just tidying up some legacy arrangements with the criteria for the CIS scheme. Those of you who use the CIS scheme or have clients who use the CIS scheme will know that there's a necessary um, requirement to demonstrate good compliance behavior when it comes to taxes. And VAT is going to be added to the list of compliance factors which a subcontractor needs in order to qualify for the gross payment status. And powers will also be extended to allow HMRC to remove gross payment status where there's any fraud in relation to PYE, CIS or VAT. There's a few technical consultations in this area. And if it's, under, if it's, if it's of interest to you, I'd encourage you to have a look at those. Um, there's also plans to digitalize CIS payments for subcontractors from April 2024. One of the key changes for companies is the decision that the Chancellor made in respect of full expensing. Now, I've just got a little bit of a reminder for what we're talking about when we're looking at full expensing. So full expensing is expenditure on new and unused plant and machinery by companies. So. Two key points there, it has to be new and unused plant and machinery, and it's only available to companies, it's not available to unincorporated businesses. Now, the legislation for that was in Section 7 of the Finance Number 2 Act 2023, and that stated that full expenses would apply for qualifying main rate um, expenditure between the 1st of April 2023 and the 31st of March 2026. The change that's taken place in the autumn statement is that clause one of the autumn finance bill is to remove that 2026 date from the statute books and full expensing will apply permanently. Now, when we say it will apply permanently, it is as permanent as the current government can make it. It doesn't bind itself or any future government to make any changes, um, although it may well be a politically difficult decision to, to rein back on that. Um, we had in our commentary, we did notice that, um, and we did comment on the fact that it's only as permanent as the, as the time of the current government. I haven't heard any party political positions from any other parties to see whether there would be any threat to that, but it, it's, it'll be helpful for businesses to have an 
extra level of confidence beyond 2026, um, potentially in respect of full expensing applying on their capital expenditure. There are general exclusions as, as ever when it comes to these things. Um, it's important that we all remember that you cannot get any fixed uh, full expensing on cars. That's a, the, the usual one with any upfront allowances, different car regime. Uh, we did talk about that in our spring tax update for owner managed businesses. Um, so if you want to know more details about cars and the, and the alignment, we've got quite a few queries about cars at that time. And that is something that um, you can have a look at if, if you want to know more about that. A point that some people forget with full expensing is that there's no allowance in the final period of the business, but that's quite common with the um, first year allowance type tax reliefs. There is the 50% first year allowance for special rate pool, again, not cars, although you might have a car in the special rate pool because of the emissions, you cannot claim first year allowance. It's, it's, it's the, I want to say the, uh, um, the poor cousin of the of the 100% relief in the main pool, um, that because most people um, talk about the, the full expense in applying on your general pool additions, but you can get your 50% um, first year allowance on expenditure in the uh, special rate pool. So things like, um, the, the list is there. The ones that I used to see when I worked in practice were things like water, um, heating systems, um, air conditioning, electrical, that's that's the main ones, but you can also have um, special rate pool uh, additions on lifts and external external solar shading as well. And long life assets are also included in this. So any additions with the exception of cars in the special rate pool, that will continue um, indefinitely. Under both regimes, whether it's the main pool or the special rate pool, whilst it's welcome news that full expensing is going to be applied permanently, it's also worth bearing in mind that when the asset is sold, there, is, there can be a clawback of an allowance. So for the main capital allowances pool, that's 100% of the disposal value. So if you sold and bought an asset for £10,000 in a company, and it was sold for £5,000, the £5,000 would be chargeable. So you get £10,000 first year allowance through full expensing on purchase, but when it was sold, regardless of whether there's a capital allowances pool or not, it would be a balance in charge of the full amount. If you're looking at an asset that's in the special rate pool, because it only gets 50% first year allowance on year of acquisition, the clawback is only 50% of the disposal proceeds. So these are some of the implications that will be coming through. So if you've got clients who have expenditure year in, year out, and if they sold an asset, they would buy another asset, then they wouldn't be too adversely affected because they would get the full expensing on any subsequent additions, assuming the rules were still in point. Uh, but if you have someone who maybe is sold but not replaced an item of plant machinery, it could have an impact on the company's tax bill because the 100% disposal uh, value would be a balance in charge, which would be payable at whatever rate of corporation tax the company was paying. And just as a slight aside, no changes to annual investment allowance. That permanent limit has been permanent so long as it's been announced. Um, that's an option for companies if full expensing is not available. For instance, if you had a if you had an addition that it was second hand, it wouldn't be eligible for full expense. And, and in the case of unincorporated businesses, they don't have the option of full expense and they've got to go down the um, AIA route if they want 100% uh, upfront tax relief. It has to be an AIA qualifying business. And the definition of that is in section 38A of the Capital Allowances Act 2001. Now, that will include individuals um, carrying out of a trade. It will include um, well, individuals in business. It will include companies and it will include um, partnerships. But it's important to bear in mind that the partnership has to comprise entirely of individuals. So if you've got a corporate or partner or a trust 
as a part of that business, we do not be able to qualify for EIA. And they can be a requirement for EIA to be shared between businesses under common control. We've done, we published some guidance on this in the ICAST website, and it's also been covered in webinars earlier this year. So I'll not go into that in too much detail just now. Sticking with companies, research and development. It's been a busy year already for the research and development regime for companies that are carrying out innovation. In April this year, there were some changes to the RDEC and SME rates. Now that was in response to the government's perception that there was a lot of spurious claims um, in the SME market in particular. Many of our members tell us about uh, how their clients are approached by companies who offer to look at their R&D claim, claiming a percentage of their uh, tax refund and so on and all the rest of it. And quite often some of these um, claims have got no validity and reality and but well, that doesn't stop um, clients being sold these things. And I would draw your attention to some guidance that uh, we've published on our website earlier this year. If you have a client who has been approached by a third party and you feel uncomfortable about including that claim in the corporation tax um, return, I've heard lots of different examples um, of claims which are clearly have got no R&D in them at all. Um, I think I did hear um, the most recent one I heard was something along the lines of care homes trying to claim PPE as being R&D, um, which clearly isn't within the scope of the legislation. But I'm sure those of you watching this webinar will have, will have got um, involvement with clients who've got R&D claims will have come across many different examples. There are two changes that took effect in the year to try and um, discourage uh, claims that are have got no basis from being made and um, the first is the requirement of the claim notification that may, because it's only for accounting periods on or after the first of april it's unlikely that there'll be many of these so far it'll be something into 2024 in most cases that a claim notification has to be submitted via an online form no later than six months after the end of the company's period of account. Now that's where the company is claiming R&D for the first time. It's claimed for a previous year, but not submitted a claim until after the claim notification period. Uh, and the last date of the claim, the company's no last date of the claim notification period, which ends six months after the last period of account. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Or the company's last claim was more than three years before the last date of the claim notification period. So once a company is in the habit of claiming R&D on an ongoing basis, this is not. A, this is only to indicate that you've got new claims. And I think for those of you who are working in practice, who have got clients who've had uh, been approached, um, I remember when I was working in practice, quite often it would be on the last day in the, uh, or, the or a couple of days before the deadline to submit an amended claim, out would come this R&D claim from this third party. And it sometimes it was and uh, things that were glaringly obvious in it, but that won't be an option because you've got the, the HMRC will have to be told at a much earlier stage because it's necessary to submit this claim notification uh, no later than six months after the company's period of account. The second um change in terms of how you actually make the claims is to do with the additional information forms which have to accompany claims by um rd claims made after the 8th of august 2023 now i've put on the slide some of the information that you need to put on the additional information form a lot of it will be very easily to hand things like the company details utr tax references industry code um, who the internal r d contacts are so the hmrc you contact them or an external agent details about the accounting periods the expenditure any indirect costs and the project just sort of setting out the basis of more details so the hmrc can see what's included in the r d claim 
Now, what we have heard in our discussions with HMRC is that some people were unaware of this. I know my colleague, uh, Susan Cattell, has written some articles on R&D and the new requirements for both the claim notification and the additional information that's on the ICAS website. Um, but the first uh, few weeks, there was quite a high number of claims went in without the additional information form. So it's important. I mean, most people who are routinely doing R&D claims will have um, we well worse than that because it's came in um, a few months now. So after that already busy year of R&D changes, there's a few more changes in the pipeline. So the autumn statement announced that there's going to be a merged R&D scheme. If you look at Schedule 1 of the autumn finance bill, that'll give more details. It almost could be a webinar in itself. Um, that'll give you more details of some of the technical points. Um, but in essence, instead of having the two separate RDEC and um, SME schemes, it's just going to be one merge scheme, and it's likely that we'll see the 20% RDEC uh, rate applying going forward. Um, now, in the finance bill, there's a clause 16, which talks about the appointed day. Now, I only flag this up um, just in case there's any, if it ends up that as April approaches, there's some problem that the government sees, then it can be quite quickly changed um, if the um, Treasury regulations, the tre Treasury regulations have to be laid in order for these changes to take effect. Now, I understand that that would mean they um, have to be laid by early March because there's a number of uh, sitting days of Parliament has to, uh, notice has to be given for, for regulations that are being being set. So I think if we haven't heard of any um, changes by early March, we'll have to assume that the announced date of 1st of April, um, exp uh, expenditure and accounting periods from the 1st of April will, will take effect. Um, but that is certainly what um, the legislation says. Very briefly, there's there's um, additional um, relief. And there was a, a change in the spring budget this year to do with uh, what they call intensive R&D intensive SMEs. Now, they are, um, it's all to do with loss relief and the element of loss relief that um, was available. And if you've got qualifying, 40% qualifying costs um, of the of all the company's costs, then HMRC would accept for the year from April 2023 um, to 2024, um, that the um, HMRC would accept that as a SME intensive, the threshold is going to be changing to 30% from April 2024 onwards, although there is plans to have a, a grace period for the for the first year. And that is all to do with loss relief. So there's an um, additional loss relief available for the SME intensive companies, um, but for those profitable companies and those companies which are um, SME intensive but don't have the 40% or 30% going forward uh, threshold, there's going to be, uh, they'll just have to deal with the, the new merge scheme going forward. There are some provisions on contracted R&D in terms of uh, making sure that companies which contract out their R&D are still able to claim relief. And um, there's a little bit of dubiety in the rules, so that could be open to interpretation. And I haven't got time to um, go through all the details in that uh, as part of this wider tax update this morning. The last thing I'm going to say on the uh, R&D is to do with nominations and assignments. And this is all to do with particularly those um, third parties that I mentioned earlier who may have a percentage cut of their of the R&D um, refund that they generate. So. To achieve that, they've often arranged for the repayments of the R&D to be um, nominated, assigned to the third party, and then presumably they take their cut and then pass that on to the any remaining amount onto the company. Now, HMRC um, doesn't like um, that, so hopefully it'll, it'll be partly discourage, partially discouraged these um, claims that might be a little bit spurious um, and that the companies are not going to get their, the, the third parties are not going to get the refund first 
um, all the money will have to go back to the to the company who's made the R&D claim. And then presumably if they do engage with third parties, they'll need to um, respect their, attend to their fees thereafter. Very, very briefly on pensions, um, the lifetime allowance charge was removed from the 6th of April 2023 um, and it was not technically abolished at that point, but the Autumn Finance Bill includes a provision um, to do that from April 2024. We talked a lot about this in the spring budget, so I'm not going to talk to you much of the wider um, tax, implica uh, tax implications of this because we've already covered that in our earlier updates, um, but it's important to bear in mind we still have the annual um, allowances in place. So there's also not a lifetime allowance, there is an annual um, allowance for pensions. And the last point on this slide, it's important to seek independent financial advice before making any pension decisions. Um, very, very important to, to bear that in mind because although there might not be a tax charge, there might be other financial um, implications that a, a financial advisor would be able to advise the client on further. So behind all the um, detail of the um, Chancellor's speech, I don't actually think he mentioned making tax digitally speech at all, but there was um, quite a bit of detail announced in the uh, supporting uh, papers that were released alongside the autumn statement um, on the 22nd of November. So just a bit of a recap, where are we on making tax digital for income tax self-assessment? Uh, just uh, under a year ago, 19th of December last year, what some people will have seen as an early Christmas present for many, there was the delay in the mandation of making tax digital for income tax self-assessment or MTD. It's a April 26 um, turnover about 50,000, April 27 turnover of 30,000. And for businesses with turnover under 30,000, that was being looked at as part of a, a small business review um, that was, uh, the outcome of which was announced in the autumn statement. The MTD ITSA um, will apply for self-employed businesses and landlords with income. Now, if you've got someone who's got uh, income from rental income and turnover from a business, you need to add that together when deciding whether they meet the £50,000 or the £30,000 threshold. April 2025 was originally supposed to be when partnerships were coming in, but that was postponed this time last year until a later date. There's not been any change on that. And making tax digital for corporation tax will happen sometime after that, but not anything happening in the foreseeable future. So we stick with ITSA for just now. The Small Business Review was a wide range of external stakeholders, including ICAS and the other professional bodies. And because it involves um, landlords, there's landlord and um, trade bodies, as well as the wide range of, of business trade bodies that exist. And I know the HMRC has been working very closely with software developers because they have to be able to be clear about what is uh, what can be done with the software, especially at the smaller end, where costs are quite um, a key concern. And that was one of the key concerns that I um, raised on behalf of ICAS um, in terms of the, the smallest of businesses. Now, we actually argued that this was a time for a fresh approach to the quarterly updates uh, for unincorporated businesses. Now, under the VAT threshold, most of those businesses, uh, most of those who are dealing with MTD or VAT, will be um, above the VAT registration threshold. But um, the um, so we felt that it was important to make a distinction with that. Um, HMRC hasn't um, taken that point on board. I know some of the other professional bodies have made similar representations. Um, but for the time being, the outcome is that it's not going to be extended for now, at least, to those self-employed businesses and landlords with um, income below £30,000. Um, I suspect that it's likely that HMRC will wait to see how things go with MTD ITSA once the population with income above 50,000 come in in April 2026 and then 30,000 in April 2027. So it's not a, it's not happening, it's, it's, a not, it's not happening for now. So we'll watch this space and wait to see what happens 
with those um, businesses with income, self-employed businesses and landlords with income of £30,000, uh, under £30,000. The other things that changed in the autumn statement to do with MTD for ITSA, there's an expansion of the exemption criteria and there's some new regulations have just been published in the last week for consultation. They will, um, if you're interested in feeding back into the con consultation, please do get in touch with uh, myself and I'd be interested to hear your views. Unfortunately, for those who work in ITSA, the deadline is the 12th of January, so it's not terribly helpful while those um, while people are dealing with the, the peak period for the self-assessment um, 31st January deadline. But if you have any comments, even if it's uh, brief comments, please do get in touch. Um, the adoption of practical measures. I work with uh, HMRC on the various um, stakeholder groups. And as part of that, I've been attending some workshops to deal with some problematic areas. And the, there's been a reflection of the feedback that's been given to try and make sure that there's more um, detail, um, details or more solutions available for some, but not all of the problematic areas. To encourage more so software developers into the market, there's been a review of the minimum software standards for MTD ITSA. Again, bearing in mind those smaller businesses and the possible changes that could come if the decision for the income under 30,000 is, is reviewed. There's going to be some support for those businesses that are not aligned with the tax year. We've got basis period reform um, in the pipeline this year of transition. Um, there is going to be some com uh, communications on beta testing, encouraging uh, businesses to volunteer early, and I'll talk a bit more about that at the moment, and also a new penalty regime for those adopting MTD ITSA before they have to, um, before mandation, whenever it applies for their business. So the existing MTD ITSA criteria has got income thresholds, we've um, spoken about those already, and um, the digitally excluded, and um, that tends to be either religious reasons um, or those uh, taxpayers where it's not reasonable or practical for reasons such as age, disability, remoteness, etc. We've had that for making tax digital for VAT and our understanding is, is that if you're exempt from MTD for VAT, you will also be exempt from MTD itself. There are a few other cases there where they're specifically exempt. Non-resident companies chargeable to tax under Part 3 of ITOIA trustees, executors and administrators, and foreign businesses of taxpayers domiciled outside the UK. So that was the existing criteria. Now, this autumn statement has added in two extra ones, so for foster carers and also taxpayers with no national insurance number. So I mentioned problematic areas a few moments ago, and just to give a little bit more details as to what these are and how the, the, the suggested solutions that the government has offered in the autumn statement. There was a real concern when it came to if anyone had made any errors in their MTD ITSA returns, how could they correct them in years? So that's going to be possible with cumulative reporting. So if you make an error in one return and if there's another return in the same year, you can correct that by adjusting the cumulative figures accordingly. The end of period statement, um, there was a suggestion that you'd have to make, and, and in the regulations that are um, were in, originally in place, um, you had to make an end of period statement in MTD ITSA software um, to deal with things like um, adjustments and capital allowances and all the rest of it. That's now going to be part uh, covered in part of the final SA declaration rather than um, a separate additional end of period statement return. With MTD ITSA, there's also a likelihood that a taxpayer might have more than one agent. For example, they might have a bookkeeper who supports them with their day-to-day -day accounting requirements, but also an accountant who deals with their year-end. Um, and and the, how it will work will vary depending on each business and how much support they need and whether they have a separate bookkeeper. But to try and make life easier for avoiding agent authorities being revoked and all the rest of it, there, are, there is going to be a, an ability to have multiple agents in respect of MTD for ITSA. The rental income is part of MTD ITSA and when you've got a situation, when I worked in practice, I had a number of clients who owned properties in various different ways. 
they um, owned properties based on sometimes themselves, sometimes with their spouse, sometimes with different family members and various combinations and different ownership structures um, and all the rest of it. And for those businesses, MTD, it's, it might have been a complete nightmare in terms of sharing information, especially when the ownership um, was different for different properties. So there is going to be an, what they call an easement um, so that it would be possible for jointly owned properties um, to have uh, income only, you wouldn't have to report the expenses. And that might reflect the fact if one joint owner is more involved with the maintenance of the properties, but another joint owner is more involved with the letting and so on. But uh, you don't have to do that. You can still um, submit income and expenditure with MTD its returns. It's just that there's the option to have income only. But it's important that this specifically for jointly owned properties um, it doesn't apply for individuals who only own a property um, themselves as a, an individual. And the autumn statement also announced the option for businesses below the VAT threshold to have three line reporting. So without too much detail behind the, um, the what's reported to, to HMRC in their, in their MTD quarterly returns. And maybe this is a, a slight recognition of the point that ICAST made about how the, the burdens of MTD it's a, um, would be more felt by those with turnover below the, the VAT threshold. Just a little reminder of the key dates in the year. So um, for the four quarters, you're looking at 6th of April to 5th of July, 6th of July to the 5th of October, 6th of October to the 5th of January, the 6th of January to the 5th of April, with all the returns being due by the 5th of the following month. Now, it is possible for the business um, to make a calendar quarter election so that it might be a little bit easier for um, the other accounting requirements because most businesses would be more likely to draw up their accounts um, or their management accounts or whatever to a, a month end as opposed to the fifth of a month just because that happens to be what the tax year is. And we've spoken a lot about what uh, the mandation requirements of MTD ETSA are. Then there is, however, uh, an encouragement on the part of HMRC to volunteer to join MTD ETSA before mandation. Now, for the current year, 23-24 tax year, that's been limited because the pilot that was in place was only available to those who had 5th April year ends. Um, so even if you had a 31st March year end, which was the same as the 5th April, and in terms of the tax um, before any changes to basis period reform, et cetera, it was um, that it, it, it wasn't possible to volunteer in the current um, tax year. Now, HMRC is going to be publishing details um, to broaden the scope of those who can come into MTD it's uh, early. There is going to be um, a new penalty regime for those who do that. Um, although it sounds more draconian than it actually is because it's quite light touch before mandation takes place. Although you might be expected to do returns quarterly, there's not actually going to be any, any penalty until you've missed two annual deadlines. So quite light, light touch um, for anyone who volunteers early. Now, although there's maybe been an element of apathy um, in our profession in terms of volunteering before, um, I would say that I am um, Hearing, the noises that I'm hearing from HMRC are such that it seems highly unlikely that April 2026 will be pushed again. We've had a few deferrals already and there is a genuine commitment from HMRC to do that. So I think any decision to put off um, until um, you have to absolutely have to would be um, you know, it's, it's less of a less valid than it than it might have been at one point. So um, what I would say, though, is um, in the firms that I've been speaking to and other discussions that I've had, is that there's maybe an opportunity for each firm just to maybe put um, a handful of clients in just so that you know that your firm is fully ready for MTD ITSA. And there's a suggestion it could even be a, a unique selling opportunity for your firm when it comes to attracting clients, if you've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. Um, so while I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to move all your clients on earlier than they have to, because that would cause a lot of challenges, and it might not even be possible to do that, because there's certain 
clients that that's not a, a, an option. Um, but it is possibly worth um, considering putting through um, a small number just to just to test how things work and give you the confidence that you need about how this is going to work for your clients. A little bit briefly on the HMRC software requirements. Um, it's all about the API or the application programming interface. So you could be looking at API enabled spreadsheets. Now in some cases that might be sufficient. Um, and where that's not enough, um, it might be possible to have bridging software in order to convert those records into the API format that HMRC needs um, to process the MTD its uh, um, returns. It's important to bear in mind that there is an expectation of there being free software as part of this. Um, it's not it's going to be HMRC produced some software like you've seen with um, the RTI payroll software that is available for smaller payrolls. Um, but there's expectation that the software market will produce something that whether it's any good, the free software, or whether it's sufficient for a particular client's requirements, then the proof in the pudding will be in the eating, but we'll just have to wait and see for that. But just to, to flag up that um, very briefly. Um, a little bit on the cash basis for the self-employed. Um, this was a part of a consultation that ICAS responded to back in the spring. And from next year, the cash basis for the self-employed will apply as default when it comes to calculating the taxable profits for self-employed businesses. If you want to carry on using accruals basis, you'll need to elect for that. I expect you'll be able to do that on the tax return. But to make life easier for those who do um, wish to use the, the default cash basis, the current £500 restriction for interest costs is being removed and the current restriction on loss relief is being removed. So for some people, it might be um, an easier way um, to deal with MTD for, for, for ITSA. And there are some transitional um, rules and adjustments for moving from one uh, method to another. And HMRC's guidance is a little bit light on that, but it's something that we'll be working on um, looking at now that we know that this is uh, a decision is actually being made when it comes to the, the cash basis. But you can still have a, um, a cruel basis is still an option. It's just that it will no longer apply by default. And I was speaking to someone yesterday who acts for clients who are barristers, so you wouldn't expect them to necessarily be um, a key consideration, but there, because the, the £150,000 threshold has been removed, it'll even be an option for those who are on the highest of incomes but self-employed to, to use the cash basis. So just um, highlight that at the moment, and we'll be publishing some more details of that in the coming weeks um, on the ICAST website. And just in terms of wrapping up, some, some topical issues, basis period reform. We did a webinar on basis period reform earlier in the year um, and also one with HMRC in the autumn. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this point, um, but just a reminder that we are in the transitional year for basis period reform. Um, and if you haven't had discussions with your clients um, about this, it's important to do that as, as soon as you can because going forward, it will be only possible um, for profits to be taxed on a, on a tax year basis. So have a think about um, how it will affect your clients uh, for the 2023-24 tax year. You might decide to change the accounting year end. And I've heard firms, some people are very keen on having everyone on to the 31st March or 5th April year end because it makes it easier for compu uh, computing the tax. Other people are then thinking, well, what happens when it comes to the workloads of the accounting practice, bearing in mind that in the longer term, you might be dealing with additional work when it comes to MTD, it's in returns for those clients that you need to support on a quarterly basis. So each firm will have to make its own view as to whether it wants to change accounting years en masse. It's a, it's a little bit of a trade-off um, but in any case, it's important to have a think about whether the spreading relief that allows up to five years applies by default, or it allows, uh, although it applies by default, you've got a choice to some extent because it is possible to accelerate the, the adjustments if you've got losses or unused personal allowance or something like that. In your client's tax return um, in a particular year, you might want to accelerate the spreading adjustment um, to take account of that unused relief. 
um, it's also part of any other broader tax planning measures that you might be you might be doing. And very briefly um, on voluntary national insurance contributions, just a reminder that for um, those men born after 5th of April 1951 and women born after the 5th of April 1953, we've had a few changes in the last year of the deadline for going back um, to make voluntary national insurance contributions. We spoke about class two voluntary national insurance um, earlier in the talk, um, but for uh, voluntary um, contributions more generally, it's only going to be possible from April 25 to go back six years. So if you've got any clients who might not have um, enough contributions for their state pension and so on, it's um, worth um, looking at whether or not they can make, um, you know, whether it's voluntary class three or class two or whatever, um, those contributions after 2025 can only be backdated for, for six tax years. And very briefly on the high income child benefit charge, and there's quite a lot of articles on this on the ICAS website. There's been quite a few case law, um, and, and some of them quite interesting and quite random outcomes. Um, but when you've got a taxpayer with income of above £50,000 and there's a child benefit claim in the household, Hickbeck is assessed on the higher earner. Um, it was previously necessary to register for self assessment. But after LD in the autumn, the late summer, early autumn, uh, it was possible to have the HICBIC liability coded out. Um, it's important to think about the impact of not claiming child benefits. So the technical um, route is that if you've got someone who doesn't want to receive the child benefit in the first place, you would register and then claim to not receive the payments to preserve the national insurance history. There was a little bit of a talk um, earlier in the year about um, something to avoid the need to have to do that so you're not having people losing their state pension entitlements, etc. cetera. Um, but we're still waiting to see um, some of the details come through on that. And last but no means least, um, the ICAS tax team um, has, as David said, lots of ongoing discussions with HMRC on how to improve its um, services and how to make um, life more easy for our members when supporting their clients. We do this in various ways. We hear a lot from our members about HMRC service standards and how they are not as good as they should be. Um, we write letters to the government on that, but also have private discussions behind the scenes. So please do let us know um, how Things are going for you and your practice. What's causing uh, frustrations? What's uh, whether what are the problems that there could be solutions? And we'll do our best to relay those and try and say, uh, we, they don't always um, make a difference in terms of. But I think the more the more HMRC knows by um, HMRC knows about the issues that are affecting us, um, then they're more likely they'll be able to do something about it in the longer term. So get in touch with us and um, send us your feedback at tax at icast.com. Um, there's lots of other things that you could look at. You can tell HMRC directly using the H Agent Online Forum, but please tell us about the issues you're facing as well. And um, there are opportunities to join our ICAST tax committee as well. If that's something of interest, have a look at the advertised vacancies in the new year. As it says in the last point in the slide, if there's one big problem you're encountering at the moment, do let us know. I'd be happy to speak to members or send us an email and, and get in touch and let us know um, what's what's happening on the ground so that we can do our best to help. And David, I think that's um, all the slides I was looking to cover today. We've probably run out of time after thinking it was going to be a light touch autumn statement and just covering some of the um, initial um, points and um, that whirlwind tour has resulted in not being much opportunity for questions so if there are any we maybe need to cover those um yeah I, I, so I thanks very much chris yeah i think there, there were just a couple of questions come in one of which i know was covered in your, your presentation so we we don't need to cover that one uh the other question just very briefly and it's not really a question as such uh or that requires a technical answer it's more a question of what icas is doing um, so the, the question was around the full expensing of capital allowance and obviously it only being available for companies um, and not for partnerships or sole traders. And the question is, are, are ICAS lobbying for this to apply to unincorporated businesses um, as well? 
Um, I, I don't think we've had any dialogue specifically on that um, as yet, but it's something that we can we can we can have a look at. We can speak about in our tax committees just to see what our members are thinking about this. Um, but as you say, it, it only applies to companies, and it is on the back of the um, super deduction that would otherwise have been pulled. Well, the super deduction went on the thirty first of March, um, and it was to make sure there wasn't a cliff edge a cliff edge for companies, but. Um, Really interesting point. I'd be happy to look into that further. That's great. Well, thanks, uh, Chris, very much for uh, taking us through all those uh, developments and a really comprehensive uh, roundup. So, thank you very much for for that, Chris. As you say, we have uh, sort of ran out of time, so we'll we'll move on and um, just say thank you very much. Do please remember that uh, everyone can keep up to date with all the latest information, guides, and resources. Uh, for practice and tax professionals on ICAS.com. And if you have any uh, technical questions or technical support that you need, then contact us through the ICAS Technical Help Desk, which is available through the contact us section of the website. This, of course, is the final ICAS webinar of the year. So it only leaves me to once again thank uh, Chris um, for today's presentation, um, but also very much to everyone in the audience for joining us not only today, but uh, throughout the rest of 2023. Um, so uh, as we approach the festive season and Christmas, uh, I do just want to wish everyone a very happy Christmas from everyone at ICAS, and thank you very much for joining us today. And until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>